Hello, I'm going to just record this video and share this with you. I'm going to write some scriptures on cards that I want to keep with me and take to work and stuff like that to meditate on scripture more. I used to do stuff like this and I have for a long time. I've been meaning to again. And sorry if this video is laggy. It looks like it already is going to be. But I'm going to look at this, um, like, the, the 25 most read Bible verses on BibleStudyTools.com. And it has them in uh, some other translations, so I'm going to get them from the King James. And some of these are passages like the entire Psalm 23. I'm not going to do those. I'm going to do, you know, the shorter ones. So it won't exactly be 25, but you know, I thought maybe I would just see if I can comment at all on any of the specific verses. And... Um, I want to do a lot more. I'd like to just go over like, you know, like 20 uh, verses in Proverbs or something, you know, uh, and maybe I'll go through and just pick out certain ones or, or whatever, but, you know, meditating on any Bible verse is, is good, so looks like the first one is in Jeremiah 29.11. I'm opening the eSword program on the computer so I can get the King James Version. So, let's see, I'll have it over here on this other screen. Jeremiah 29.11. And so this is just kind of for my personal use, and I might make some for some other people, but I would also just suggest that anybody would do this if you're interested. And you can just write it on anything, on any piece of paper or whatever. But I've got these index cards that were given to me, so I want to make more use of these too. And I'm probably going to laminate these. So, this doesn't have to be perfect. I'm going to try to write a little better than I have for my notes. Jeremiah 29, 11. Says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I might want to use it on this screen because uh, this might be a long video if I'm actually going to do this <laughs> writing all these down. I don't know how far I'll actually do this, but uh, I don't know if I want to give it a space here. I think I want to give it a space between those. Hopefully I give myself enough room. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, That's a phrase that you see a lot, saith the Lord. It was it was all capital L O R D, but oh well, I messed up in that one. It's fine. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. I don't even know how the volume's gonna work on this, but try to talk louder and talk into the mic closer. To give you an expected end. To give you an expected end. The language is obviously different than the modern version, whatever version this uh, Bible study tools uses. Their version says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So this says, the King James says, Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now I mention a lot that, uh, you know, Calvinists can misinterpret this. I mean, Calvinism, I mention all the time, but basically they twist so many verses that, and, and Calvinism is so popular that anybody 
getting into studying the Bible can get mixed up because they're reading resources and you know they may interpret it in a way you know without even learning about Calvinism they may interpret it in a Calvinistic way or or they study into it and they use other resources and they come across the Calvinist version of it but I think that you know Calvinists can take this and say that you know God had plans for Jeremiah and basically that God um, predetermined everything for Jeremiah and so you know God has already laid out everything for Jeremiah and, and so and and they would say the same for everybody else so basically you know all men that God created are like robots and we just do the will of God whether it's good or whether it's evil it's all what God has wanted us to do that's not what this means and I do think that this verse is kind of specific to Jeremiah as far as him being you know a prophet and stuff like that but it is applicable to everybody that in the sense that, you know, for one, God does plan for, you know, he wants all men to be saved. The Bible says that he's not willing that anyone should perish. So God does have these general plans, you know, a plan for for every man, whoever whoever will, to come to him. And God wants what's best for man, you know. And that's one of the things that I came to realize when I got saved, when I gave my life to the Lord, is that, you know, a lot of the mistakes that I made, or, you know, all the mistakes that I made in life, you know, big things, um, just, you know, crimes and doing drugs and, you know, um, being unfaithful to, to people, you know, partners that I was supposed to be with, uh, things like that, you know, um, just... I know that uh, I just I came to the realization, you know, that I, I knew that you know some of the things that I was doing was illegal, you know, against the law. But also, and you know, I've been in trouble with the law for things like that. But I also knew that you know some things weren't moral that I was still doing it. But I knew because I kind of was raised in church in and out of it. You know, I knew that you know these things weren't of God and when I came to the realization when I gave my life to the Lord that I realized you know I could have saved myself a lot of trouble now that doesn't mean that Christians have a perfect life obviously you know Christians are persecuted and in, and in you know the Bible days and in other countries and stuff not so much in the US maybe but you know believers in Christ are persecuted to death you know tortured and murdered and so just because you follow the God, God doesn't mean that you're not going to have pain and suffering, you know, basically. But but there's still a peace with God, even through that pain and suffering. And I guess maybe that's the difference that, for one, the things that I did before I was saved that caused me the suffering, um, you know they they were wrong the things that I did and they weren't for for good reasons they were for selfish reasons and they were and you know they were not of God and so I'm kind of getting lost here my thoughts but I mean I came to the realization I guess you know God kind of opened my eyes and and I realized that I could have sa saved myself, you know, some of the pain and suffering, and, you know, at least, you know, the, the pain, the, uh, you know, the broken relationship between me and God, and I guess, so that's where I, where I came to God, I realized that God doesn't have these, you know, these rules or laws and scripture, you know, don't do this, you know, this is sin, this is wrong, you know, you'll be punished if you do this and punished if you do that. It's because it's for your own good, okay, because God knows what's good for us. It's not just because God is just some kind of evil dictator, you know, he just makes things up for no purpose. No, it's because ultimately, you know, they're to benefit us because God knows what's best for us and God wants us to, you know, glorify him. And so, you know, with this Jeremiah verse, um, God said that, you know, he has plans for Jeremiah to prosper him, uh, thoughts of peace and not evil, 
give him an expected end, which is kind of interesting language in the King James Bible, an expected end. I would like to to read a little bit more of how that's, you know, how that language is used, but it's basically, you know, that God wants us to um, to live well, and he wants what's best for us. And so, in a sense, I think it's, it's kind of specifically talking to Jeremiah, but yeah, that's applicable to all of us. But it doesn't mean that God has laid out everything for us, and, you know, that, that everything that we do is because God wanted us to do all of this. Um, we have free will, and so this doesn't in any way deny free will. But it's a good verse because um, it does say, you know, that, that God wants what's best for us. He knows what's best for us. You know, he has a plan for us, and, um, you know, he wants us to come to him, follow him, to be a disciple. And so the next one they have on here is Psalm 23, and, you know, pretty much got that memorized by heart, and uh, I'm not going to write that down right now. Then it's got 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, you know, the love passage, and I'm not going to do that right now. So the next one is Philippians 4, 13. Philippians 4.13 and in this, their version it says I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This is a very popular verse. One that I used to have memorized. And I mean basically, you know, I've got the gist of it memorized anyways, but I don't memorize that it's Philippians 4.13 but I know, you know, that Paul said that uh, he does all things through Christ who strengthens him. So, it's Philippians 4.13 and in the King James, it says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ. which strengtheneth strengtheneth me important verse uh, don't even know if a whole lot has to be said about that pretty much to the point um, I mean the all things in some ways, uh, you know, it doesn't encompass everything. It doesn't encompass sin. He's not saying, you know, I can sin all I want. Christ strengthens me to do it, or whatever, you know. So, um, we have to look at the context. And that's what that's an important thing when you look at all these popular verses and stuff. They can be, they have applications to us, which are really good. But we also need to understand the original context in which they were meant to be understood. And so, um, you know, the verse before that, he says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. And so he's saying pretty much in all situations, um, you know, the Lord strengthens him through the good and through the bad in life, you know, through the rough and, um, you know, he always goes to Christ for his strength, and that's what we need to do. And so this is a great verse for us to uh, to realize, you know, that Paul is our example, um, and Christ is our example, and so we need to rely on God. Uh, and I'm sure that all of us fail constantly at doing that, you know, consistently. God is uh, always there for us to go to, and I think that, I know at least for myself, a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of times when I should pray about things instantly, and sometimes it doesn't occur to me till later. It's like, oh yeah, uh, it's kind of like a secondary thing for me to go to God. It's like it needs to be like the primary thing. So, uh, that happens, but it's constantly uh, something that we work on.
and I might just do, you know, a handful of verses, because I don't want the video to be like an hour long, but I do want to get a bunch of them, because I'm going to take these with me, I'm going to look through them each day, try to memorize some of them, and even if you don't memorize, you know, the chapter and, and the verse, at least remember, you know, what book or what epistle they're in, or, or just... Just remembering, you know, the basic the idea. It doesn't always have to be word for word in chapter and verse. I mean, that can be helpful to show people, you know, if you're talking to other people and you know basically where to find it. But, um, you know, I just want to keep these verses fresh in my memory. We've got John 3.16, and, you know, <laughs> that's so common, but I'm going to go ahead and write that down anyway. So, can never have enough of John 3.16. For God so loved the now let me look at the uh, King James version which is basically identical I think John 3:16 For God so loved the world could mention Calvinism again because John 3.16 is a major one that has to deal with that. That he gave his only begotten son his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him Whosoever should not perish, and the Calvinism interpretation of this is so twisted. This is really a great verse to refute Calvinism. Of course, they don't see it that way. Everlasting but have everlasting life. And so, they say uh, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Um, and so, you know, the obvious interpretation should seem that, you know, whosoever means any person, any individual in the entire world can have faith in Christ, and whoever does uh, will not perish. But, you know, they say that, basically, people believe people believe in Christ because God already chose them to believe, specifically, and, and so it's kind of backwards, and, um, and, you know, they would say that when it says that God so loved the world, you know, a lot of Calvinists might say the world means Jews and Gentiles, it doesn't mean, like, every individual, uh... For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. There's also, you know, we see the two distinct persons. So the Trinity doctrine is kind of in there. So that's obviously an important verse for salvation. Let's go to the next one. Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28. says, but if we hope for that we see not, then we... That's not right. That's not the wrong one. That's Romans 8.25. Sorry. Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. More Calvinist uh, implications there. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And we know that all things again we see all things and we have to understand the context of that all things work together for good work 
together for good to them that love God. You know, somebody could say like, so this means I can go out and kill somebody, and that means that it it, it means that it works for the good of God, or whatever. I mean, that's kind of what uh, Calvinists uh, believe is that, you know, even rape or murder or anything like that, um, like somehow God is glorified because it's God's will for for these things to happen. <laughs> it's pretty messed up. All things work together for good to them that love God, comma, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Then there's the whole thing about, you know, the called, or it's just like the elected or whatever, where Calvinists would believe that these are, you know, terms for individuals who are already determined to salvation by Christ, um, as opposed to those who were determined to damnation by Christ. But those who are called, you know, are people who have put their faith in Christ. And so it was of their will that they did that. So um, I think I've talked about this verse before. And uh, yeah, in Romans eight twenty nine, it talks about predestination and stuff. This is the deep, you know, Calvinist stuff that they would, they really try to use to support their stance. Romans 8.27, before that, it says, And he searcheth the hearts, or he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to his will of God. Before that, it says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know that we should pray for as we ought. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I'm pretty sure that I've already made a video about this verse, but I don't really want to say a whole lot because I need to look into it again to really give you the specific understanding of what it means that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Because I think it's kind of a little bit more specific than people think. Um, I mean, it is pretty straightforward, but... But it can be taken wrong ways. And so It's a good verse, but I'm not going to say much more on that one. I'm going to do one more, I guess. This will make it five, and then maybe I'll make other videos the next days as I go over some more. But this is Isaiah 41, 10. Let's look at that. This is why I really need to get my website back together, which I'm going to be working on in the next couple months. I'm going to have to make some different changes and go some different directions with what I wanted to do. But, you know, once I can start getting commentaries up for these verses so I can just go straight to my website and just look at, you know, what the notes that I already had on that instantly, it would be a lot more helpful. But I probably have a video just with the title of Romans 8.28 or something similar to that. Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Wow. I might have to not have a space on this one. Maybe I can get away with it. We'll see. Fear thou not.
for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Well, that kind of explains why Paul says that he, he, everything, you know, Christ strengthens him. <laughs> I will strengthen thee. I guess I have plenty of room. Yea, I will help thee. Hold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. That's interesting language too, the right hand of my righteousness. I wonder if some people have attributed that to Christ, but I think it's just kind of just language that, uh, a phrase, um, we know that God is righteous, and, uh, and so I, he's kind of like saying that to strengthen, um, to strengthen people who believe in him and to help people who believe in him is like and to uphold the or it's kind of it's part of his righteousness it's part of um, you know his attribute of righteousness part of that is to strengthen and to help those who follow him so again you know like I said in, in Jeremiah where he said that, you know, he wants to prosper us, basically. He wants to... He has thoughts of peace and... What else did it say? <clears throat> he has thoughts of peace and not evil. To give us an expected end, basically. And so that is the God's righteousness. You know, he's not... Uh, you know, he doesn't want to mess us up. He doesn't want to hurt us. He doesn't want... You know what's worse for us, and again, that doesn't mean that you know, like I said, just because because followers you know are persecuted and stuff, it's not that we're not going to suffer for the name of Christ. But uh, you know, as far as our own doing, you know, towards ourselves, as far as. you know, our salvation and everything. God wants what's best for us, so... Praise the Lord. So, I need to go over these more, but... I'm probably going to laminate these eventually, but I want to do more of these. But it's good for all believers to do this. I don't even know if this stuff's on camera or not. I'm not looking at the camera right now, so... But... That's that. Uh, thanks, guys. God bless.